Hi, and welcome to the Day One Podcast. My name is Simon Moran, and today, for Episode 9, I am sitting down with Mr. Tommy Fisher. Tommy, how are you doing today? Great, Simon. How are you? So, to start off, um, we go back to maybe the earlier parts of your uh, growing up and things like that. So, tell us a little bit about your childhood and how you know that influenced to where you are today. Well, I grew up in an entrepreneur family where you know Dad started the whole business shoveling sand by hand. So you watched firsthand um, on the work ethic that, you know, my father and mother had different employees and, you know, it just gets in your blood to see people work. And of course, you know, as a kid, you're into sports and you're into different things, but you still sure. did, did the company uh, stuff. And, you know, I remember a teenager, you wanted to earn your own money. And so you stack steel so you'd have enough money to pay for your friends to go to a movie right, or yeah. different things like that. And learned it probably 12, 13. I wanted to keep you know, take control of my own destiny. So how early on were you getting involved with uh, Fisher Industries and going out there and doing work? Well, um, mom said she went into labor in the gravel pit with me uh, <laughs> by bouncing around. So yeah. maybe even as an infant. But uh, I remember as a young kid sitting on dad's lap, you know, running, you know, equipment no different than my boys learned right. um, with grandpa and stuff. And uh and then, you know, you, as you get older, um, I don't care if it's sweeping the shop floor or cleaning out the garage or stacking steel or something, we were always involved with the business. And, but he always, dad was sort of smart. He'd put a basketball hoop down by the shop. So sure. if the shop was clean, you guys could play basketball. Cool. And in the winter days in North Dakota, if you could play indoor anywhere, it was a good deal. No kidding. So as far as school's concerned, were there other things along the way that you may have considered as opposed to coming into uh, the business today? What were some of the other things that you had interest in? Well, d during um, high school, I played high school basketball and, and varsity all the four years and, uh, and then got into tennis because uh, basketball is where I really wanted to, you know, hopefully be a pro That's basketball where the dreams player. Were, sure. Yeah, the dreams were until I went to University of Kentucky's basketball camp and the first guy I guarded was <laughs> Nick Van Exel okay, and I figured yeah. out real quick, oh, I'm good for North Dakota, but that's about where this career is going to end. Right. So, but I did play a lot of tennis and end up with a tennis scholarship that put me to DePaul University in Chicago. Okay. And um, I worked on this uh, Chicago Board of Options Exchange for Charles Schwab. I had an interest in, in math. You know, I was really good at mathematics and different right. things. So trading was interesting to me. But uh, my parents allowed me to, you know, go through college and then end up transferring to ASU, uh, which, you know, I was doing some stuff for dad, buying and selling some equipment. But when school was done, it was time to come home and, and uh you know, take over the business. Right. So was that what g gave you the exposure to Arizona in the first place was coming out to ASU? Was that the first time you had come out here? Y yes, it okay. was. Yep. So I had experience, you know, in Chicago and that part of the country, and I really fell in love with Arizona. And so, you know, after school was over or graduated in 94, went back and then ended up taking over the company and became president and CEO of Fisher Sand and Gravel, 1996. Okay, so when did that transition happen to opening up a sector of the business out in here in Arizona? So we were in uh, Dakota for uh, four years, and um, my ex-wife was from Arizona, and she wanted to get back to Arizona. Okay. And our company was about you know maybe a thirty forty million dollar company, and you know they did the same thing. But what bothered me a little bit was it was a great company. Um, but it was cyclical. You had to work so hard in eight months because when the winter came, you were shut down. Definitely. You fixed a lot of your equipment. And we looked sort of at the weather and the growing population of Arizona. And even though I was president and CEO, I still went over with my father and said, what do you think right. about me just going out with a couple of foremen and, you know, two crushing spreads and giving it a shot? Sure. And um, so he, tell me a, a little bit about those first couple jobs that you did out here in Arizona. What what is your you know bread and butter when it comes to Fisher Sand and Gravel? Well, at that time, Fisher Sand and Gravel was a crushing company, portable crushing. So we'd move in and we'd make out of sand and gravel or quarried rock, your rock that you'd make asphalt out of for hot mix roads or concrete or base gravel. OK, so we'd work for primes, you know, prime contractors as a subcontractor. So uh, those were some of the first jobs. So we started with like two portable crushing spreads. And in a very short time, we grew it to 10 portable crushing spreads because we sort of took the Midwestern work ethic and farm farmer mentality Definitely. ethic that you got seven months or eight months to make all your money. Right. And then now we were able to take that same 
um, philosophy and put it into 12 months out of the year. Okay. So we really performed high from what most people saw down here. So we built a lot of relationships with several construction companies. It really helped catapult when we get to the next part of how did Fisher really grow. Okay. And, and as far as growing into the company, I know your family had, you know, you looked to your, to your dad as a mentor and things like that, but were there anybody else that kind of gave you influence in your life that made you want to come down this direction and really become a successful business owner? Well, I think, you know, anything, you know, mom taught more of the loving side, maybe a little more of the hustling side. Dad was a hundred percent, you know, hard work and right. different. You needed a combination of both. You had to be outgoing sure. and not be scared to put yourself out there and, um, and, and, and learned, you know, both, both ways. So I think between both of them, it helped. And then just, um, you know, growing up in high school and college, I traded baseball cards and memorabilia. I had my own business. So I met a lot of, you know, star athletes from Scotty Pippen to Horace Grant, Frank Thomas, Sammy Sosa, different guys that we did card shows and stuff. And I was always, an entrepreneur to buy and sell things or different things because that's what I like to do. Right. So when it comes to the business today, what are some of the things that you run into that you have to overcome uh, when it comes to getting contracts with the government or working with different companies to be able to facilitate what they're requesting? What are those things that you guys do um, from a process standpoint to, uh, to select and do your business? Well, I think because as we grow, grew from just a crushing company to a very vertically integrated company, because even though we were a crushing company, we were a steel, steel manufacturing company that we made all our own, own equipment to crush. That gave us a real uh, leg up on the competition from someone that just crushed and had to buy the equipment from somewhere else. And then as we got into asphalt paving, concrete paving, mass earth, you know, we, we started to self-perform. So as we did that, we controlled our schedule. So the owners like that, because if you said, hey, we can get this job done in a year, and they thought it was a year and a half, we really control our own destiny. We don't have too many subs. Right. So if one sub falls down, you know, that's one uh, thing that can slow you down. The other thing was, is growing the company, I was a subcontractor to a lot of the companies and contractors we compete against today. Okay. And I was able to meet a lot of people that as we grew, you could figure out who were really the workers, who were the ones that got it done. You know, in every company, you got stars and you got A people, B people, C people, just the sure. way people are. But, um, you know, where I was able to do that. But one of the things is, too, is some of the companies didn't treat you very well as a subcontractor. And I'm always one that if you're on our team, whether you're a subcontractor supplier, once you're on the Fisher team, you're there. Okay. We treat our people really really well that way. So I think, you know, that'll help us get the best prices going into the jobs and we get the most um, motivation, you know, out of those subs because they know they're going to get paid on time. They want to work. They want to work with the winning team. And it's helped us really do some amazing, you know, big, big, amazing jobs. Okay. So what are some of those jobs that you're working on now? What are some of the bigger projects that you guys uh, have at Fisher Sand and Gravel? Well, the largest one we ever did was right at about a half a billion dollars. We did the largest job at that time for the state of Nevada, I think today they've built one that was a tad bit bigger okay. in downtown Vegas. But we we built a section of roadway that con connected Carson City with Reno, Nevada, and it had the North America's largest cathedral arch bridge. So it was basically a cathedral arch bridge is a structure that has a span based on a thrust block and then an arch to come connect right. the bridge. And it was two football fields wide with 350 feet in the air. Holy cow. So it was a project that everyone said could never be built. Okay. Uh, the state attempted. The first contractor asked to get out of the contract after seven columns were put up on the bridge. So NDOT called it Stonehenge. <laughs> and then in the end, a lot of engineering companies said this could never be built. Wow. But at that point, we were doing some other large private jobs. And we were able to go from a bonded job at $50 million and where the bonding company allowed me to bid a $400 million project. But the difference was is we filled up the whole canyon with uh, dirt and then <clears throat> monolithically poured the arches instead of using a steel pilot truss hanging out in the wind. Right. So we changed the design for NDOT which NDOT allowed us to, and we created value by an extra 35-year lifespan of the bridge and much more safe to do it. So that ended up winning us ENR project of the year, and I think it was 2012 or 2013. So after that, you know, and some of the other projects we did, a $250 million grading project where we put up 49 miles of rockery walls, moved 17 million yards. It sort of put us on the map that we could bond in the multi-billions. 
And, you know, since then, you know, we've chased work that really fit our company. So even though we have that capacity, we've always still stated about a half billion dollar company and um, just find work that really fits us. Right. And it sounds like you guys really take a creative approach to what it is you're trying to accomplish. You try to be the most efficient you can be and you, you know, are able to do jobs that most people are, you know, say that can't be done. So tell me a little bit about why you guys go that extra mile and take that extra step to make sure that you guys get the jobs done right and are delivering for these people. I think it comes back to the talent of our employees. We have such a broad base of employees that are so talented from the engineering side, PE people that can stamp designs with your ability to build what you need. Like if we needed a conveyor to convey material over, you know, uh, a ravine where everyone else would have to haul around multi-miles. Right. We've got that advantage. Or we see things a little bit different that way because we can do that. Or we have patents on, you know, whether you're placing uh, bridge walls or concrete walls or hanging bollard fences like down on the border wall or different things. Those are all things that we can get with our team. We come back and what's the most efficient way? And what really it comes down to is I always ask our people, if you were that person that had to work in that construction job day in and day out and you wanted 100% efficiency with safety, what would you do to make their job better? Mm -hmm. And that's how we sort of come together. And um, like dad always taught too, use gravity as your friend instead of trying to fight against it. Sure. Because it's always going to win. I like so that. some of that yeah, things yeah. and, you know, the closest distance between two points always is a straight line. Mm -hmm. Anyone who tells you any different. So if you move your dirt that way, if the way you build your construction projects, you know, in that sort of theory, mm -hmm. you can always get, you know, get ahead. The other part is by being vertically integrated, a construction job, no different than building a house. There's sequences to get to the end. Right. Like you got to pour your footing, to pour your floor, to put up, you know, uh, the framing and then sheet rock and, you know, tape and texture paint, no different than a highway road, you know, right. storm drain goes in or you got to move dirt, but can you look far enough ahead and concurrently build a lot of the other project at the same time so you get to the finish line? Quicker, and then, yeah, and then yeah. keeping the whole orchestra on note or key that someone's not off playing over here only to get in trouble because they missed out the piece that they should have been over here. Right. So it looks like you're really starting to manage some very big projects. So what in, in your in your shoes do you do as a leader to help facilitate those? And what is your approach from a managerial standpoint? Or how do you connect that message with your employees? Well, communication, number one, I think um, there's a lot of different ways you can always build something and also be open because we have a lot of smart people that work and, and, and make sure no one's scared to um, ask a question or flex an idea or anything like that. Right. And, and then vet that. And sometimes we do a lot of planning and strategic sessions on, hey, how to build this better. But we have such a vast experience of lessons learned on some projects and, and benefits gained on others and different things that, again, with communication, it, it's always, you know, a better way. And, and then we're also a company that no matter what job we build, whether it went great and you made, you know, more than you thought or under budget, even more on time, we still go back and say, hey, was there anything else that we could have done better? Right. Working with the owner or outreaching to the public or different things like that. And I think that's the main thing is, you know, remember what went wrong, you know, and, and fix that, but also remember what went right and try to enhance that and um, go. But again, it comes back to um, not every person in the company knows everything, but when you have a lot of people that talk and you got tons of experts on all the things, you know, different facets, you can really come together and, and really move. Right. So as far as the projects that you're working on today, are those projects where you go and solicit the project or do you have people also reaching out to you to do projects for them as well? Uh, a little bit of both. Okay. Um, sometimes we're a personality, like we're still going to continue to solicit on the, the wall. And in, in, in my me, mind, it's going very slowly. I mean, 50 miles in three years right. that doesn't cut it. But if we've got the technology, it's out there trying to prove and get the government to trust. Now, a lot of places that we've built up relationships with Arizona Department of Transportation, Nevada, New Mexico, those people know us. So when they put out big jobs and we're low, they're happy for us to come on. They know a lot of times, hey, we might have some value engineering ideas mm -hmm. to help the job go faster, maybe save the state some money sure. that you can split and stuff. But uh, those are the different things. And then word of mouth, you know, people see, hey, you built this project that people said couldn't be built. Not only did you do it, you did it very fast. Now I got interest. Hey, could we take that same type of 
uh, mentality. And instead of building a wall, could you build a pipeline or could you, you know, build a roadway in a very obscure part of the world or right. something there? Or we'd love how your equipment is. Would you sell your patent in this country or something? So there's a lot of tentacles that come out. As far as your um, the employees, then are you hiring based on location or are they traveling with, you know, where the project is? That's one thing with Fishers, we're a little more mobile. Okay. So you might be hired in Phoenix, but you might be working in Kingman or uh, you get an emergency job in New Mexico or something that you go out. But um, there's also facets of our company that, you know, we sell asphalt in Phoenix. Right. So those guys, every day, they're going to get up and they're going to sell asphalt. But again, even though you're doing the same thing day after day, we try to be the market leader in quality, on-time delivery, all those kind of things. And, and when you do that, you a lot of times develop that good trust with the customer and maybe that trust elates to maybe you make five more percent mm -hmm. because they'd rather pay a premium right. for someone that they can count on. Because if you don't deliver on time, they got a lot of people on the payroll waiting Certainly. for that mix. And and so those are all the kind of things. And because we're a general contractor and also a supplier, mm -hmm. we understand all the facets. Right. So we understand the guy that has to supply, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe be working for us as a general contractor. But we also understand when we're the supplier and we're working for that general contractor that has another customer, that he has to be successful for us to be successful. So it all comes down to, I mean, business construction anything it still comes down to teamwork okay yeah of course now you told me before we started that you guys had built a private section of the border wall already tell me a little bit about the importance of the work you're doing down there and as well as the method you guys are approaching with that so you know we're still working on the public side you know still quoting and we're going to keep fighting until we break through and like i told them <laughs> to every government person i talked to once you put us in we're never coming out of the game right yeah. there is nobody who can build faster and it's not a a cocky thing or it's not anything it's a belief that our people um are the best and our patent is unmatched and so our our biggest thing is is what makes that faster is instead of setting one panel at a time, we have a patent that we can hang five at a time. Okay. So as you're moving that, and then there's no false work or bracing because the big excavators hold everything, mm -hmm. like uh, like you see back here, sure. as, as, as they hang. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, with that, um, we're still going through the process publicly. A private company reached out to us, said that they've raised you know 25 million, 30 million on a GoFundMe account, and um, uh, triple amputee Air Force veteran that went out on his own. He didn't have to do this. It took a lot of heat for raising money, saying the wall wouldn't be built. And so they picked one of the hardest spots in all of America, straight up the side of a mountain yeah. in an uh, old active mine site. And so that's the one project that it, it'll go down in my history, even though I think it was a more impressive project than even building the $500 million bridge job, mm -hmm. was because... In the time that we did it, in five weeks from start to finish, from not even knowing in the project, we were able to go up and I climbed up the mountain with my, you know, youngest son. Then we came in there and we ran the drones to run, you know, the topographic map, right. designed it, went back to the owners where we build the wall and said, hey, this is going to be our estimate if you want to go, you know between five, $6 million to do it. Yeah. And they had done some of their research where they had heard, you know, the government said it would take three years and $30 million. <laughs> and they were like, is this guy crazy? <laughs> right. And then like, well, how long is it going to take you to build? And I yeah. said, yeah, maybe a couple of weeks. <laughs> and, uh, and so they were like, you know, sort of thinking, Hey, does this make sense and stuff? And I said, well, just trust in us and we'll show you that we know what we're doing. Right. So we amassed the people. We went to the steel mills. They jumped through their hoops to get us the steel because we wanted to use a, a higher quality steel that would last. Mm -hmm. If we're going to build something and we know something's going to rust out in 20 or 25 years, we don't want to do that. Right. And so I don't care if the government's doing it. If this is going to be our name on it, we want something that's going to last. Certainly. So the, the mill did it. Then we used another arm of our steel manufacturing business that as soon as that steel came in, they already started to build the panels. At the same time, we took another arm of our business, the excavating arm, with the engineering, we started doing the mass grading. So in a matter of four days, we changed and we completely transformed the way the mountains look right. to get you the access world you know, for the road and stuff. And a lot of things that they make the mistake on is if you just build a fence or a wall mm -hmm. or anything, but there's no access for the agents, what do you got? Right. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah People exactly. can cut it. They can climb through it. You're going to fix it. But when you put the technology and the infrastructure with the fence 
that was the main thing. So we brought in our uh, subcontractor electrician and we did everything else with the concrete. And then we found a concrete supplier to supply us, but we placed it all and built the road. So we formed this team real quick within about a week, came out there and then on Memorial Day weekend, we started putting fence panel in on uh, Friday night and uh, would have finished Monday. There was some, or Tuesday, there were some issues with, uh, we build the wall on the permit or something. Right. And it wasn't really that because my belief is an act of mine, mm -hmm. but to be good neighbors, we honored what the city said. We tried to work with the city the best. And I've given the city a lot of the, the building plans and hopefully we rectified all, all that. So they're comfortable that what we built is better than what they get, you know, from the government. Right. And, um, and then we finished on, you know, Wednesday and finished the road a couple of days later. So in a matter of 10 days, wow. you know, you That's built this, yeah. you know, this huge project that was roughly 200,000 yards of dirt um, a concrete road for 2,300 feet or half mile, half a mile of fence, half a mile electrical, half a mile of security cameras, all in. So I think the government really opened their eyes because they've never seen anything like this before. Right. So now we're in that stage. Okay. We're the same company that gave you multi-billion dollar unsolicited proposal to secure from El Paso to California in four years. Yeah. Enough talk. Just get it done. Just get it done. Yeah. We're going to come back with a different design on the Rio Grande, taking in all the environmental concerns, the flood concerns. That will come out in about three weeks. Okay. And I think at this point now, it's not because if you say something so different, like if you only played football, right? And all of a sudden I said, I can run a two flat. And the fastest you've ever seen a guy run was a four two. Right. Well, two flat, you're like, you're doesn't insane. make any sense. Yeah. Right. Well, that's a little bit like what we're saying in construction. Right. Okay. But then once they saw it, they're like, it actually can happen. It can happen. Yeah. So now what do we do? How do we make it fair to make sure that it's fair for the taxpayers, fair for everything, and, you know, just go through? So I think we're finally ready to move the needle right. on some stuff. Now, I, I know you've spent a lot of time and your family spent time down at the border. Um, what does it mean for the agents that are working down there and the people that are living down there to have that infrastructure built for them? Well, if I can just talk on our section... It's unbelievable. I had I had agents hug me, um, almost tear up. Yeah, because they were not afforded the chance to do their job properly. If you have to go chase someone up the side of a mountain, good good person, bad person, whatever. But if you cross illegal, mm -hmm. you're illegal to be in this you know country. Right. So they have to do their job. Well, a lot of places they couldn't because you know if the drugs would move this way, and a family unit would come down here and claim asylum the agent didn't know you know what to do or they took multiple agents here and they came this way since we built the the fence not one crossings happened but what they told me the main thing is is no crossings are happening because they can see that they can make it the, up the whole side of the mountain not in 30 minutes not in 40 minutes but in 30 seconds right so no matter where they're at you're never going to beat the car in the road and so my belief is in the end i think it's more humane to build the whole entire fence because there's a lot of young mothers in foreign countries and their children that are being promised by bad people that I can get you in and here's what you get. And you know what I mean? There's a lot of yeah, people yeah. that can hustle and sell a lot of hope. Oh, definitely. And, and then, you know, these poor people are dying and, you know, maybe they want to come and have a better life, whether mm -hmm. it's legal or not, that's for the government to decide. Right. But the main thing is, is if, they knew unequivocally that there was a border security system that was going to meet there, then I don't think they could be talked into is easy to try to do this. Right. You know? Yeah. And I've personally spent time, I went to Brophy and, and we did a service project where we went down to the border. We actually sat down with some immigrants and talked to them about their experience and stuff like that. And sometimes it can be really tragic and horrific having that, you know, trying to cross the border and things like that. So I think there's definitely, if the right minds are put together, there's a civil way to make the process happen. But, but I, I believe that having that infrastructure there is really a, a big thing for that community down there. And a lot of people will tell you that if they haven't you know if they haven't been down there then they don't really know what's going down at the border so well and i tell a lot of people too like when we worked and we built it and it was hot if you didn't have water i, I just couldn't even imagine yeah. me being loaded up and and you're at someone else's mercy forget about all the real bad stuff but i'm just saying just being just dropped the weather off, yeah just being dropped off and not knowing where you're at and say walk that way well, when you're out there in the mountains and the desert or something, it's it all looks scary the same. pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah. And you get thirsty. And, and so that was my main thing. But 
again, it was worth everything that we went through to get there to see what the agent said. Because ultimately, that's what we want to do. We want to build the best infrastructure. Because to me, I see it way more as infrastructure for agents mm -hmm. than I see it as a big wall. Right. Or there, I see it as really a border security system to protect America. Definitely. So for the, what does the next five to 10 years look like for Fisher Industries? What direction would you like to see it go? And, and from a growth standpoint, what are you guys looking at? Well, of course, I'm fortunate again, and, and God bless me with two young, smart sons and a, and a daughter here. And both the sons are, are now actively full-time in the business. Awesome. So um, I get a chance for uh, going my third partners, generation now. third yeah, generations. Yeah. And, um, you know, they're already better operators than I was at their age. And I think they know a lot more about the business than I did at their age. So they've got a huge, huge opportunity to take it as big as they want. But I always preach too is do what you love. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love to do with this. At one time when I was younger, I thought oh, construction. You know, right? There's a lot of other things. I'd rather be a rock star now or a rock crusher, or you know, different things like that. Sure. But I think once it gets in your blood and you get good at anything, you start to like it. And you want to wake up in the morning and do it. So I encourage that. I think we're in great hands that way. I can start to see the next generation coming in. And learning and then the fun part is is how technology is changing our business like before we had to go stake everything mm -hmm. now you can build models on the computers the big equipment runs you can see where you're at and the better you get with survey and the more you understand in your mind and you design better the more efficient you become and i can only imagine like by the time i'm 80 another 30 years mm -hmm. is it so perfect with technology that you can judge down to the last pebble of dirt right you yeah. know what you're doing Certainly. for the owner for their and then the more accurate you are the more safe you are because every task that you do one extra is one more chance to be unsafe so how you take that out of the equation is is one thing that we're always working for at fisher so i think with uh, both uh, ryan and grant's involvement it's sort of given me a second wind mm -hmm. to try to pass on everything that uh, I have. And, you know, sometimes we have disagreements. Sometimes we have that, but that's good. Right. I want them to have their own mind, just like every employee. It doesn't have to be my idea by any means. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm pretty a personality where <laughs> I'll battle for that idea, but I'm the first one to give someone a hug that if it's a better idea and it helps our company gain in capital and, and, and efficiency, I'm all for it. Okay. And, and in wrapping up here, what is one thing that you would maybe pass on to Ryan and Grant or tell our viewers when it comes to either construction or business? What's one thing as far as advice that you've learned over the years that you would tell them is a key part to, you know, every day when you get up, this is something that you do? Well, I think the biggest thing is, is I believe our key to success is I'm a pretty hands-on operations guy. Mm -hmm. And when you see that and you can talk the talk and walk the walk, I think that builds motivation for your people. And I'm not against any owners that I'm just going to handle the banks and the bonding company and that. But I think if you're truly building construction or people that are in management, I believe they should come from you know, the field up so they understand everyone from someone sweeping the floor like I first started or stacking steel and understand humanity, what they're doing and trying to make a better life for themselves. Right. And gearing all that up that everyone's part of the team to, to get there. But the biggest thing is, is you got to love what you do. If you love what you do, remember what you do. Mm -hmm. If you don't, I mean, just put yourself back in school, right? There were certain classes that you enjoyed in school, right? certain classes you had to take. I'll bet you a dollar to a donut that the That's classes that you didn't definitely like, true. couldn't remember your teacher, couldn't remember what it was, but the ones that you did and that what you had a, a love for or whatever, you could almost remember everything. Definitely. And, and, and I think that's where the difference is, okay. is, is there is just, you know, having the passion too. And I think if your employees see it, you, you lead by example. And I think you see some of that and whether it comes to coaching or, or anything. So, and the fun part was getting back to that is, you know, sometimes in our work, I get to get away from this desk and go run some equipment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, you know, you remember what you started with. So for some of the viewers who may be interested in learning more about your company or approaching you with a project, what's the best way to reach out to you guys and get a hold of you for uh, future projects? Um, I think if you go on our website, fisherind.com would be a good spot or call in. And, and again, you know, we're pretty open. We're down to earth people. And, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of people sometimes will call up and the secretary will ring through and 
I pretty much answer my phone. Right. Because you never know who's on the other side. Sure. And just like if I call out someone there or we give you an unsolicited proposal for the multi-billions, right? Yeah. You can choose to agree to believe me, but you probably should just take a look at it and see. And if it you know, makes sense, move forward. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us on the Day One Podcast. Tommy Fisher, I really appreciate your time today. All right. Thank you. Yep. You bet.